My name's Kath and I'm the Creative Director for Conservation Without Borders. This is my boss Sasha Dench and she is the CEO of Conservation Without Borders, otherwise known as the UN Ambassador for the Convention on Migratory Species, or more dramatically, the Human Swan, which she was named after she flew from Russia back to the UK tracking the migration of Buick swans. Next up was the Round Britain Climate Challenge with Sasha flying around the UK to highlight climate solutions. But days before the end of that expedition, in a freak accident, she fell 150 feet. And while she broke a lot of bones from her jaw down, she somehow survived. Despite many operations to put her back together and six months in hospital, she was determined not to let injuries deter her from out on mission. So against the odds, in 2022, she set off with a team to follow the osprey migration from the UK to Africa, living out of vehicles and tents. She set off in a wheelchair and came back walking. And with amazing results and stories to share. In this vlog, we will share some of those stories and take you behind the scenes of life of Conservation Without Borders. It's been a pretty spectacular afternoon watching them. This is we go and the incredible people we meet along the way. While Sasha provides updates on our mission, her recovery and showcases life on the road, me, I will spend most of my time in Zambia trying to work with five cats and wildlife that also doesn't see borders. Also, hopefully I'll be able to showcase some of Africa's incredible places and people. Yeah, it's looking pretty foggy out there, uh, but uh, they are apparently going to take off. The really interesting thing for me is that probably the reason I learned to fly in the first place was because of an incident in an airplane in South America involving pretty incredible turbulence. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's a story for another day. We have been having significant turbulence. You might just feel a little bit in a moment. And so they had just woke everybody up who was sleeping to put, make sure they had their seatbelts on. Uh, but I have also managed to measure the turbulence via my cheese sandwich. See you in Quito. This week we left the UK and headed over to Ecuador where Sasha was presenting at the South American Bird Fair. She also got the opportunity to mix with some incredible conservationists, also make some plans for some exciting future projects. If you're liking what we're doing, please do give us a little like below. talk yesterday unfortunately I don't think there was any footage taken of that um, and uh, we're in, about to have other talks and uh, there was a massive power cut uh, and so everybody has cleared the area until later but I thought I'd take this moment to do a quick thank you to a key element of a talk in a foreign country because if you get it right it's magic if it's wrong it's really 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 can be really bad um, Sylvia thank you very much so Sylvia You're was welcome. doing uh, the simultaneous translation uh, yesterday and the reason I know that it uh, works well is that you get the right kind of feedback from the faces of people and uh, the laughs in the right places if like a couple of seconds behind but it was amazing. Thank Good. you very I'm much. Glad. I'm glad it worked. Thank you. Um, it is an amazing story. Yeah. For yesterday's presentation it was super inspiring. See the limits you pushed in order to preserve uh, swans, super inspired. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yes, it, I had goosebumps and so much emotion because it was an inspiration, um, especially as a woman, you know, I felt empowered by this Amazon or Viking of a woman. And yeah, your, your presentation was excellent, you, you make me make goosebumps, I, I don't know if you can see, it was really, really impressive. So this morning, after a very early start, we have come out to uh, a place where there are hummingbirds and hummingbird feeders and this incredible view of the cloud forest, um, which is being obscured by cloud, funnily enough. Uh, Nicole is our guide this morning. 
And uh, you came here, Nicole, about how long ago? 20 years ago, did you say? About 20 years ago, yes. And um, I asked earlier whether or not this was a virgin forest, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, or some of it isn't. It, some of it isn't. So um, the, before actually tourism started here, people uh, used the land in a different way. There was a lot of like agriculture in this area. There was um, uh, timber. Uh, product or uh, timber logging uh, for for timber and um, a lot of cattle farming mm -hmm. um, and since tourism was a better income um, people shifted those activities and the land use in the area shifted and actually um, in many areas the forest had a chance to grow back been shown photos from Mindo like in the 80s it looked it was much more deforested than it is now so it's it's gotten much much greener so it's secondary vegetation that has come back but the, our forests recover actually quite quickly yeah so. you've got kind of perfect conditions haven't you mm -hmm. it's, it's humid yeah. there's some as long as there is still more uh, some other forest around um, it is quite easy for the forest to grow back Antiguamente era muy sacrificado la ganadería, tener que tener mucho terreno para alimentar las vacas, luego cargar la leche de, de, a, de la reserva de agua. muy lejitos cargado era cansado. Entonces ahora que estamos ya cerca de la vía y es un poco más, más mejor este trabajo porque la ganadería toca irse bosque adentro a traer el ganado en el aguacero todos los días de domingo a domingo sin descansar y lodo entonces mejor conservar la naturaleza y vivir de la conservación que es económico o sea es mejor la economía it's a permanent decision is a day by day uh, there are all day by day pressures so we have to enforce that it's okay to live with nature. It's okay the sustainability because we have economic benefits, social benefits, and of course environmental benefits. And uh, after these 40 years, everything has changed. Uh, still, of course, we have a, a lot of new pressures, but the most of the people here lives from ecotourism, bear tourism, uh, adventure tourism. Yeah. So. It's, it's a, a completely change. It's a and completely new way to live. <laughs> and uh, that is the, the, the one of the most uh, marvelous things that uh, here um, you can see how uh, uh, nature, how generous is nature. So after 20 years, we already have a new forest. Of course, it's not the same forest, but it's the forest. Yeah. And birds are living in again, and mammals, and, uh, and more plants. So, and biodiversity, it's, it's a still there. And I get the chance to say again that we were discussing your presentation yesterday and you affected every person in the room. Thank you. So the bit of the story that I haven't uh, told yet is that the day that I arrived in Quito, it was raining and it was getting into evening and we were driving around outside of Mindo trying to find uh, my accommodation, which is apparently a glamping place. And uh, eventually actually realized it was getting late. I really needed to sleep and this glamping property might have been a bit too uh, rough and ready for me in the state of my legs are at the moment. Thankfully in the car was a lady called Tui de Roy, who is an incredible photographer who offered me the spare bed in her room despite the fact that we had only just met. Thank you so much for that. And now because we're surrounded by hummingbirds, what is amazing about hummingbirds? And hummingbirds have perfected the ability to fly in place or fly backwards. There's only two birds that can actually fly backwards and believe it or not, the smallest ones, the hummingbirds, and one of the largest ones, the frigate birds. They can twist their wings so that they have lift both mm. ways. 
and hummingbirds do it at such a speed that we can't see it. But um, therefore they are unbelievably maneuverable. They actually have very few enemies as flying adults. The nests of course are preyed upon but because they can outmaneuver anything else on the wing. That's why they're not afraid of us right here. Yeah. Um, the tongue of a hummingbird is split, like from the, from the tip almost all the way down to the, to the base. It's like two pieces. And so when they, they put their beak into the nectar, um, they put the tongue in mm -hmm. and the tongue spreads out like that. And here at the tips, it's actually kind of like a feathery tip that then fills like up with the nectar and then they, they, they put it together again in the beak and with the beak they squeeze it a little bit. Hummingbird beaks are quite soft. They squeeze it and then they squeeze the nectar into the drop and then they ingest the nectar. For a long time it was believed Crazy. that it's capillary action that's driving. That's what the, I learned in my degree. That's what I learned and that's what I taught a lot of students for a long time. <laughs> until until a Colombian researcher actually actually did like um, um, studies with um, slow motion in like transparent tubes and looking into this drinking mechanism and he described this whole drinking mechanism which is very different from what we've learned. <laughs> Because capillary action doesn't work that, that quick. It's <laughs> no. Actually, it makes sense that it can't be capillary action because capillary action is a very slow process and they shrink so fast. <laughs> so he looked into that and he was like, this, this can't be the thing. And, and so uh, you also mentioned a story earlier about uh, uh, a man with a red nose. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite funny. It was a friend of mine. He had a, a fairly good sunburn and the tip of his nose was quite burnt and you know, glowed, <laughs> fairly pink. Yeah. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this hummingbird, he was walking down a forest trail, this hummingbird comes up to his face, hovers in front of his face, sticks his nose into his nostril and its tongue right up into his sinus. <laughs> so one of the organizers, Juan, I asked him who is the most exciting conservationist at the bird fair? And he said, I need to speak to you. So we start working, but we're feeling like, uh, okay, we are ready outside of the university with the knowledge of, you know, books and things like that, like, like uh, biology <laughs> and research. But we're feeling so, you know, so bad because we don't have the skills to you know, working well in the forest. But we find the local people who are looking at us and say, what are you doing? Oh, we try to, you know, find an uh, umbrella bird and we can also want to catch and take measures and, and then start explaining. Of course, people were laughing and say, look at these crazy guys, Let's try to do something here. But I know, umbrella bird, yeah. Some things, we, when we ask about some animals, say, ah, oh, peccary, yeah, it's a delicious one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are like, oh my gosh, it is. Did they also know where to find it? Exactly. And these guys say, yeah, we are, have all the skills to find it, really easy, and also catch. All right, let's do it. Let's show me. And then we... They didn't guys also show you show how to cook it. it. Exactly. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but catching, yes. And these guys improve a lot of the situations and then we mix each other. We put signs and train local people and these Together. things. And for those of you who are at the British Bird Fair this year and in some way contributed, therefore, to the big donation that was able to be made uh, to a project here in Ecuador, I was there as Tim and Penny handed over the donation and it was a really powerful moment. But I thought you might like to meet the man behind that project, a man called Juan Carlos, whose route into conservation is a little unusual. Um, originally, I'm a veterinarian. I studied veterinarian because I really love nature and good with animals uh, when yeah. I finished the university. I mean, yeah. yeah, I decided to take a time and just to work as a volunteer doing, so I did environmental education, I did some uh, pro building projects, I was being trained as, as a beer guide. I also work on the TV, I was a TV oh, yeah. presenter, <laughs> presenting music. <laughs> so I pay my career by working on TV, presenting wow. music and <laughs> By doing that, I just finished the university and I also work in a hotel. I have been doing many <laughs> kinds of, th of things. But then I started like, doing really serious conservation work. Uh, also as a volunteer, I was in the 
in the in the Galapagos for for four years working with turtles, uh, cormorants, penguins, environmental location, just helping with that, uh, taking photos, whatever. I was always raising my hand saying, yes, I want to do this, I want to do that. So by doing that, I had a chance to travel all over the Galapagos. And then I moved to the U.S. for a, I did an internship with the U.S. Forest Service, being a park ranger, oh. and more environmental location. And also studying uh, migratory birds with the Institute for Bird Populations. So that yeah. put in perspective what I really want to do in my life. I just wanted to dedicate my life to conserving birds and birds especially because almost everybody loves birds. They're very easy to identify. They tell us how our environment is, is, is doing. And that's how I joined Aves de Conservación in 2006. Um, since I have been in different positions, like being a volunteer, then being a technician, then being a TV presenter, then being coordinating projects. And now I'm the executive director. I know what to expect from the different points of view. Like if we want to start a volunteer program, since I was a volunteer, I really, I, I know that you want to be a volunteer, you want to do something useful, not only, um, I don't know, doing whatever. But yeah. So being a volunteer is great because it's great for your career. Uh, so I, I think now I can see the conservation from different perspectives. And Talking of volunteering, we also have some opportunities available. So if you're interested in volunteering with us, it's open to anyone who's interested in conservation. All you need to do is go onto our website and check out the opportunities page. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more of something, or if you've got some ideas of what you think we should be putting in, please also put this in the comments below. Meanwhile, if you'd like to find out what happened when the Conservation Without Borders team got involved in a dramatic seal rescue, then check out the video in this box.